Have you ever felt a little lost in your English class when your teacher began a segment on poetry? Don't worry, we've all been there. Poetry is a tricky thing to get the hang of. And, like most literature, poetry tends to get even more difficult to understand the further back you go in the timeline. So, by the time you get far enough back to reach 18th and 19th century poets, and you already don't have a good grasp on the mechanics of poetry, things can get pretty foggy pretty fast. So, I'm going to try to help you out. This video will focus on understanding poetry using the work of Samuel Taylor Coleridge as a catalyst. We'll focus on some important literary terms that'll be necessary to understand the construction of a poem, and we'll use some of Coleridge's shorter pieces to get our feet wet. Then, we'll tackle one of his longer and most often analyzed works, Christabel. So, let's begin. The first term that you'll run into often will be the word stanza. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a stanza as a group of lines of verse, which are usually not less than four, arranged according to a definite scheme which regulates the number of lines, the meter, and, in rhymed poetry, the sequence of rhymes, normally forming a division of a song or poem consisting of a series of such groups constructed according to the same scheme. Simplified, this is just the groups of lines that the poems are separated into. Let's take Coleridge's piece Work Without Hope for a moment. The poem reads... All nature seems at work, slugs leave their lair, the bees are stirring, birds are on the wing, and winter slumbering in the open air, wears his smiling face a dream of spring, and I the while, the sole unbusy thing, nor honey make, nor pair, nor build, nor sing. Yet well I ken the banks where amaranths blow, have traced the fount whence streams of nectar flow. Bloom, O ye amaranths, bloom for whom ye may, for me ye bloom not, glide rich streams away. With lips unbrightened, wreathless brow I stroll, and would you learn the spells that drowse my soul? Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve, and hope without an object cannot live. You can tell that the lines of the poem are separated into two distinct groups. This means that there are two stanzas in Work Without Hope. You'll notice that the first stanza has six lines to it. This is called a sestet. The second stanza, having eight lines, is called an octet. Following this pattern, two lines would be called a couplet, three would be called a triplet, four would be a quatrain, and so on. The next thing to know would be what a rhyme scheme is. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a rhyme scheme as the ordered patterning of in rhymes in poetry or verse. So, let's apply this definition. The end words of the first stanza are lair, wing, air, spring, thing, and sing. And ta-da! The words that rhyme with each other are now the same color. As you can see, the first and third lines end with rhyming words, and the second, fourth, fifth, and sixth lines end with rhyming words. This means that the rhyme scheme of this stanza is A, B, A, B, 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 with the A's rhyming with each other and the B's rhyming with each other. Knowing this, we can tell that the second stanza's rhyme scheme is C, C, D, D, E, E, F, F. A couple other important terms to be aware of are foot and meter as used with poetry. A foot in poetry is the basic metrical unit that forms a part of a line of verse. An example of a foot is an I am, which is two syllables that are unstressed followed by stressed. A meter in poetry is the rhythm established by a poem, and it is usually dependent on both the number of syllables in a line as well as the way they're accented. A literary device that Coleridge uses in this piece is called anaphora. Let's look at line six. Notice Coleridge's repetition of the word nor with each clause in this line. This is what anaphora is. It's a type of repetition where a word is repeated at the beginning of successive clauses for emphasis. Now, let's really try to pick apart this poem. In lines one through four, Coleridge is, in true romantic fashion, simply noticing and appreciating the happenings of nature around him. He's picking out the littlest creatures and how they all seem to be stirring at once. Lines three and four allow the reader to gather that this is either late winter or early spring as Coleridge uses personification, which is the giving of human attributes to non-human things, when he describes winter as wearing on his smiling face the dream of spring. Lines 5 and 6 contrast this notion of busyness. 
Coleridge says, And I the while, the sole unbusy thing, nor honey make, nor pair, nor build, nor sing. Remember that definition of anaphora that I gave? Here's where that emphasis comes in. Coleridge is saying that as he's watching the animals about their life, he's the only creature that isn't stirring or doing anything. He isn't doing anything productive, such as building, making, or even pairing. He isn't doing anything at all. And he realizes this through watching the animals go about their daily work. Graham Davidson describes these lines as having a sense of youthful hopes unachieved. Line 7 and 8 seem to counter this, however, as they read, Yet well I ken the banks where amaranths blow, have traced the fount when streams of nectar flow. Ken here means to know, and amaranths are flowers that are often referred to as unfading. So these two lines are basically saying that Coleridge knows very well the river banks where these flowers grow, as he's followed where they're numerous in bloom. Davidson here says that these lines represent a man of experience. Lines 9 and 10 read, Bloom, O ye amaranths, bloom for whom ye may, for me ye bloom not, glide rich streams away. Here, Coleridge is telling the flowers to bloom for whoever they will, but knows that this natural beauty doesn't exist for him, and he does not see himself as a fitting person for the amaranths to bloom for. Lines 11 and 12 reinforce Coleridge's earlier thoughts of unattained goals from lines 5 and 6, as they read, With lips unbrightened, wreathless brow I stroll, and would you learn the spells that drowse my soul? Coleridge here is melancholy, as he walks without a smile on his face, and asks if the amaranths know of what makes his soul feel tired and weary. The last two lines read, Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve, and hope without an object cannot live. Line 13 is saying that to try to do your work while hopeless is like trying to gather up nectar in a sieve, which is an object that has mesh in a frame that's usually for straining solids from liquids, which is highlighting the impossibility of this statement. You cannot draw nectar into a sieve because it would just pass through. Line 13 is saying that without hope, there cannot be any success, and line 14 expands on this by saying that If you don't have anything to actually hope for, then hope would simply drain away. Well, now that we've used a shorter poem to kind of get the basics, let's take another step towards tackling Christabel by looking at the Aeolian Harp. This poem is one of a group of eight conversation poems written by Coleridge. Conversation poems are a type of poem often used by other romantic authors as well, and they're based on events in the poet's life with a focus on the poet's emotional state and the poet's examination of both nature and poetry. This, in particular, is one that is written in what is called blank verse, which is a verse without rhyme, but almost always uses iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter is defined as a line of verse with five metrical feet, each consisting of one short or unstressed syllable, followed by one long or stressed syllable. This rhythm is read as da 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 da. Many of Shakespeare's works are written in iambic pentameter. An oft-quoted example from Romeo and Juliet is "But soft, what light through yonder window breaks." If read slowly enough for emphasis, you can more easily tell that it's written in iambic pentameter. "But soft, what light through yonder window breaks." So let's take a look at the first stanza. My pensive Sarah, thy soft cheek reclined, thus on mine arm, most soothing sweet it is, to sit beside our cot, our cot o'ergrown, with white flowered jasmine and the broad leaved myrtle, meet emblems they of innocence and love. Coleridge, as the speaker, is addressing his wife Sarah in this stanza. The word pensive means to be engaged in serious thought. So in these first five lines, Coleridge is saying to his wife, who is deep in thought, that it's a joy to simply be able to sit with her outside of their cottage, which has flowers of jasmine and myrtle leaves growing around it. And he points out that these plants are symbols of innocence and love. It's kind of nice when a poet points out his own symbolism for us, isn't it? And watch the clouds that late were rich with light, slow saddening round, and mark the star of eve. Serenely brilliant, such as wisdom be, shine opposite, how exquisite the sense, snatched from yon bean field and the world so hushed, the stilly murmur of the distant sea tells us of silence. 
Lines 6 through 12 are a lot like the first five. Coleridge is describing the scene that he and his wife are enjoying. They're watching the clouds as it gets darker and the stars begin to come out, and they can smell the nearby bean field and hear the sea in the distance. And that simplest lute, placed lengthways in the clasping casement, hark, how by the desultory breeze caressed, like some coy maid half-yielding to her lover, here, Coleridge is addressing the Aeolian harp that he and his wife have fastened to their window sill. It's important here to note that an Aeolian harp isn't like a harp that you see cherubs playing in paintings. It's a lot more like wind chimes. The air current is what makes the music. In these few lines, Coleridge is comparing the wind's occasional blowing to the caresses of two people in love. It pours such sweet upbraiding as must needs, tempt to repeat the wrong, and now its strings boldly are swept the long, sequacious notes over delicious surges sink and rise. Sequacious means lacking independence, so he's saying that the notes are at the whim of the wind and is describing how the notes are changing with their delicious surges, and how they sink and rise, or change pitch. In lines 21 through 26, Coleridge begins comparing these sounds to supernatural things. They read, Such a soft, floating witchery of sound as twilight elfins make, when they at eve voyage on gentle gales from fairyland, where melodies round honey-dropping flowers, footless and wild like birds of paradise, nor pause nor perch, hovering on untamed wing. Coleridge is saying that these sounds are enchanting to him, and is basically saying that the sounds remind him of fairies in the nighttime. For the rest of this stanza, Coleridge continues speaking of not only his infatuation with the noise, but with life itself, and begins to compare the music to existing. He says that there is rhythm in all thought, and feels like it's impossible to not be in love with the environment around him. He says in lines 33 and 34, where the breeze warbles and the mute still air is music slumbering on her instrument, which saying that even when the air is still, everything is beautiful because the music is simply sleeping. Lines 35 through 38 read, And thus my love, as on the midway slope of yonder hill I stretch my limbs at noon, whilst through my half-closed eyelids I behold the sunbeams dance like diamonds on the main. Here, Coleridge is speaking again to his wife, and is saying that as he lays on the hill during the afternoon and stretches, he looks up with his eyes half-closed and enjoys the way the sun is shining. Here's a really, really good example of Coleridge's use of imagery, which is simply visually descriptive language. He describes the sunbeams as dancing and compares them even to diamonds in their radiance. The rest of the stanza reads, And tranquil muse upon tranquility, Full many a thought uncalled and undetained, And many idle flitting fantasies Traverse my indolent and passive brain, As wild and various as the random gales That swell and flutter on this subject lute. Here, Coleridge is saying that during his tranquility He begins to actually think about tranquility itself. He's saying that many things are going through his mind at once, but he isn't focusing on any of them, as in many idle flitting fantasies, and that they're as varied as the winds that are causing the harp to make music. Stanza four is a relatively short stanza, being only five lines, and reads, And what if all of animated nature be but organic harps diversely framed, that tremble into thought as o'er them sweeps, plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all. Here, Coleridge is questioning the existence of nature itself and is comparing nature to organic harps, saying that nature is as unpredictable as the music the harp will play. He's asking himself if nature is just a physical form of God's creativity, assumed from the phrase, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all. The last stanza reads, but thy more serious eye, a mild reproof, darts, O beloved woman, nor such thoughts dim and unhallowed dost thou not reject, and biddest me walk humbly with my God, meek daughter in the family of Christ. 
Well hast thou said, and holily dispraised, these shapings of the unregenerate mind, bubbles that glitter as they rise and break, on vain philosophies I babbling spring, for never guiltless may I speak of him, the incomprehensible, incom save when, when with all, I praise him, and with faith that inly feels, who with his saving mercies healed me, a sinful and most miserable man, wildered and dark, and gave me to possess peace, and this caught and thee heart-honored maid. In lines 50 through 54, Coleridge is again speaking to his wife in another apostrophe, which in poetry means that the poet is addressing a person or idea that is absent, and is thanking her for rejecting his idle and wandering thoughts and reminding him to think of God. Lines 60 through 65, Coleridge is talking about God himself, saying that he praises him and thanks him for saving and healing him, as Coleridge thinks of himself as a sinful and most miserable man. He thanks God for giving him the gifts of peace, this cot, and the heart-honored maiden, which is referring to his wife, Sarah. Now, we're going to try and tackle Christabel. Christabel is a piece by Coleridge that is much longer than both of the other pieces that we've already looked at. Written in two parts, Christabel is actually unfinished. The first part was written in 1797, and the second was written in 1800. Recall that at the beginning of the video, I told you not to worry if you're struggling with poetry since everybody's been there. This is a poem that I personally struggled with, so I knew it had to be one to go into this project. As this piece is much longer than the others, I'm going to try and break this poem down in a bit of a different way so as to not be too time consuming. I'm also not going to read every stanza aloud. Instead, what I'm going to do is to try to briefly summarize each stanza for clarity and then explain the meaning behind certain aspects after the summarization. So feel free to pause the video at any time if you need to read. Unfortunately, due to time constraints and the length of the poem, I'll only be covering part one and its conclusion. I chose to do it this way just because I felt that it would be more helpful to offer guidance with Work Without Hope, The Aeolian Harp, and Part 1 of Christabel, rather than to solely focus on one piece so that you could get a broader feel for poetry techniques. So, let's begin. Claire May's criticism on Christabel begins as early into the poem as the first two lines. Lines 1 and 2, "'Tis the middle of the night by the castle clock, and the owls have awakened the crowing cock," causes ambiguity about what time it actually is, as the first line leads the reader to believe that it is midnight, but the crowing cock is in reference to a rooster, which usually crows at dawn. May claims that the narrator seems unable to portray a consistent sense of time, and criticizes the change of tense in both the first stanza and throughout the poem as, quote, revealing the narrator's persistent inability to represent time through the grammatical conventions. May's claims aren't without reason. It is true that the tense shifts from perfect, the owls have awakened, to past, how drowsily it crew, to present, she maketh answer to the clock. And those shifts are all in the first stanza alone. So if you feel as if your sense of time in the poem gets a little bit fuzzy throughout, don't worry. May think so too. The first stanza does have several good examples of a literary device that we haven't discussed yet. Alliteration, which is the repetition of the same letter or sounds at the beginnings of adjacent or closely connected words. Castle clock in line one, crowing cock in lines two and four, shine and shower in line 11, and line 13 is a doozy with the letter S as it reads, some say she sees my lady's shroud. <laughs> say that five times fast. Okay, sorry. Another term that comes into play in this stanza is onomatopoeia, 
which is a word when read aloud, is the same as the sound it makes, such as pop or hiss. In this case, it's in line three with the sound of the owls. This stanza is saying that it's probably the middle of the night and you can hear birds. Sir Leoline is introduced as a rich baron as his toothless mastiff howls in tandem with the clock as it strokes out the time. The second stanza is heavy with imagery about the night sky. It is saying that even though it's chilly, it's not dark outside, as the clouds are very thin and faint compared to the light of the full moon, even though the moon looks small. It's chilly because it's early spring, and the speaker lets us know that it's April by saying that it's a month before the month of May. Lawrence Berkabin notes the use of the speaker asking and answering rhetorical questions and notes that it is part of a call and response pattern seen throughout the poem. We've already seen it in the first stanza with this mastiff howling back at the clock. Stanza three introduces the main character of the piece, Christabel. A furlong is an eighth of a mile, so the speaker is asking in lines 23 through 26, what could make beloved Christabel be leaving into the woods in the middle of the night? He answers his question by explaining that Christabel had a dream about a night she would marry, so she's going out into the woods to pray for his well-being. Stanza 4 tells as Christabel goes through the woods, saying nothing and staying quiet until she gets to a large oak tree and prays. Stanza 5 tells as Christabel is startled by a moan that seems to be coming from behind the very large, very old oak tree. Stanza 6 begins with the speaker asking if the noise was just the wind that made the noise, but says that there isn't even enough wind to blow Christabel's hair or make a leaf dance. This is another example of the call and response pattern in the poem. In stanza seven, the speaker is saying, hush, beating heart of Christabel, telling her to calm down, and asks that Jesus and Mary protect her. Christabel hugs her cloak closer as she goes around to the other side of the oak tree to see what's behind it. In stanzas eight and nine, Christabel sees a woman in a white robe who is apparently so pale, her neck makes her white robe seem pale. Like, this girl is some next level pale. The woman's neck and arms are bare, and she has no shoes on, but she has gems and jewelry tangled in her hair. Christabel makes an exclamation to Mary and asks for protection before she asks the woman on the ground who she is. The woman answers with a soft voice and asks for pity, as she's so tired that she can barely speak. She tells Christabel not to be afraid, to which Christabel responds by asking how the woman came to be in the forest. In stanza 11, the woman explains herself. She says her name is Geraldine and her father is a nobleman. Five warriors, who she did not know, came on white horses and stole her away. And she does not know how long it's been since the tallest of the men left her under the oak tree. He told her that they would be back soon, and she doesn't know where they went, but soon after, she heard a bell from the castle. She then asked Christabel to help her run away from the men. Christabel helps Geraldine up and comforts her, telling her that Sir Leoline will take care of her until he can get men to guide her back to her father's. Geraldine and Christabel try to hurry, but can't, with steps they passed that strove to be and were not fast. And Geraldine explains that the house is asleep and Sir Leoline shouldn't be awakened due to his poor health, and she asks Christabel to let her stay the night. In stanza 14, Christabel leads Geraldine across the moat around her home and opens the gate, after which Geraldine collapsed as if she were in pain. Christabel managed to pick her up and carry her over the threshold of the gate, after which Geraldine stood up and moved as if she just wasn't hurt at all. This is one of the first instances that we notice something a little bit off-kilter with Geraldine, besides her incredibly strange story. 
Many people, including Birkebin, compare Christabel and Geraldine as with good and evil, respectively, and this is one of the instances that Geraldine's supernatural nature is brought into question. Geraldine couldn't pass the threshold of the gate without Christabel's help, but as soon as Christabel carried her over, Geraldine stood up and kept going as if nothing had even really happened. In stanzas 15 and 16, Christabel is so glad that they're safe from Geraldine's attackers that she looks to Geraldine and says, Praise we the Virgin all divine, a hail to the Virgin Mary, to which Geraldine replies that she can't speak and join because she's still so weary. This recoil from religious prayer that Geraldine shows is another aspect that signals to the reader to bring her goodness into question. As they cross the court, another event happens. The Mastiff stays asleep, but makes an angry moan while she sleeps, an act which the narrator is careful to point out has never happened when the Mastiff was just in Christabel's presence. Through stanza 17, Christabel and Geraldine creep silently through the halls of the house when another supernatural event occurs. There were dying embers and a lot of ash in a fireplace, and when Christabel and Geraldine walk past it, a flame starts to burn again from the ash. Christabel saw nothing from this light except Geraldine's eyes and part of her father's shield that was hanging on the wall. This is really important to note because a shield, being likely made of metal, would reflect light, much like an animal's eyes would at night much like Geraldine's did. In the next two stanzas, Christabel and Geraldine creep up the stairs and pass the Baron's room and make it to Christabel's room. Christabel's room is described as carved with figures strange and sweet and having a lamp that is attached to the figure of an angel's feet. Christabel fixes the lamp so that they can see, as Geraldine has another fit and collapses. Christabel, in her good-natured way, offers Geraldine a drink of wine that her mother had made from wildflowers. Stanzas 21 and 22 begin with Geraldine asking Christabel if her mother would pity her. Christabel responds that her mother died giving birth to her, but she recounts that the friar had said that her mother believed that she would hear the castle bell strike twelve on her wedding day. Christabel wishes her mother were there, and Geraldine responds in con kind, sorry. but here yet another supernatural event occurs that puts Geraldine in a less than positive light. She gets an unsettled look in her eye and bids Christabel's mother to leave, saying she has power to bid her flee. The next stanza continues this, as Geraldine cries with a hollow voice that this hour is hers and that the guardian spirit has to leave. Christabel thinks that this reaction is simply Geraldine being tired and weary from her ordeals, and Geraldine just replies with the fact that it's over now. Here, Geraldine drinks from the wine again, and her eyes seem to begin to glitter before she slowly stands up off of the floor. She speaks to Christabel, saying that everyone in heaven loves her, and that Christabel loves them, and Geraldine says she'll try to return that love to Christabel before she tells her to undress because she has to pray. Christabel does as Geraldine asks and undresses before laying down. However, her mind was racing and she felt that it was vain for her to go to sleep while Geraldine was praying, so she propped up on her elbow to look at Geraldine. While she's praying, Geraldine undresses slowly enough to take up an entire stanza doing so, and her clothes drop to her feet. Line 252 reads... Behold, her bosom and half her side, a sight to dream of, not to tell. Oh, shield her, shield, sweet Christabel, letting the reader believe that there's the possibility of disfigurement on Geraldine's side. Geraldine did not notice Christabel at first, but she suddenly sees her looking and collects herself in scorn and pride, and she lays down with Christabel, taking her in her arms. 
She claims that there is a spell working within her and that it has a hold on Christabel too. And that the mark on her side is her mark of shame, the seal of sorrow. She says that Christabel confided, however, because she heard the moaning in the forest and she rescued Geraldine. As a quick recap of part one, the main character of the poem is Christabel, a blue-eyed and pale girl who's the daughter of Sir Leonlime. She has a dream about a knight that she's supposed to marry, so she goes out into the woods to pray. When she's there, she meets a young maiden, Geraldine, who claims to be a noble. Christabel takes her home to rest, and as she does so, she passes her father's mastiff, who growls angrily, and a dying fire had another flame rear up. They undress to pray, and Geraldine's got something going on on her side. She tells Christabel that there's a spell that has a hold on them both, but that Christabel still has a chance to fight it. And then they go to sleep. The conclusion to part one is a five stanza aside, which is a short speech from a character that is spoken directly to the audience. In the first stanza, the narrator is recalling how beautiful it was to see Christabel praying beneath the old oak tree, and once again has a heavy use of imagery. He describes her hands as she prays, and begs the reader not to call her pale, but fair, and describes her as appearing like she's about to cry. The second stanza speaks of Christabel dreaming fearfully, and comments on how calm and still Geraldine is sleeping beside her, as a mother with her child, but calls Geraldine the worker of these harms, as in the cause of Christabel's nightmares. The third stanza calls Geraldine's embrace a prison. The narrator tells her that, yes, she had an hour, and she had her way, and I'm sorry, I lost my place one moment. The narrator tells her that yes, she had an hour and she had her way, and that even the birds were still during it, but now the birds are awake and stirring. The narrator captures the bird song. Christabel awakes in the fourth stanza from her trance like sleep, and she begins to cry. But the narrator also notes that she's smiling almost as brightly as a baby. The final stanza says she is smiling and weeping, as if she were a hermit who always prays, and the blood is beginning to return to her feet. The narrator claims that Christabel must have had a vision suite, and questions about the presence of Christabel's guardian spirit, her mom, and says that if men pray and ask for help, the saints will come, as the blue sky bends over all, meaning that heaven is always watching. So, what was Christabel really all about? One of the most prominent themes in this poem is the struggle of good versus evil. Many critics see Christabel as a reflection of purity and go as far as to labor, label her religiously good, as her name does have the word Christ in it. With Geraldine being characterized as supernatural and probably evil, she serves as a foil for Christabel, a term that in literature means a character who contrasts with another in order to highlight particular qualities. Some scholars believe that Geraldine actually works to corrupt Christabel, as she was naive and open before meeting Geraldine, although this is more present in the second part of the poem through Christabel mirroring some of Geraldine's actions, such as hissing and having a look of hate. Yeah, things get weird in part two. I recommend you read it sometime if you've enjoyed the first part. Well, we're winding down with this video, so here's some tips for when you find yourself struggling with poetry again. Look for literary devices that you've learned, such as alliteration, repetition, or the use of personification, just to name a few. They're in there for a reason, and usually it's to draw attention to something. So, if you can recognize it, go for it. If you have a particularly long piece, do what we did with Christabel. Take it stanza by stanza so you can really see what's going on in there. While I do not recommend having your phone out while you read any literature, as a student, I know how distracting this is, even if we insist that it isn't. They can be pretty useful if you don't know a word, so be ready to look something up. If you don't get something on the first try, don't be disheartened. 
Reading it a second or a third time often helps. You may have read it the first time, but that doesn't necessarily mean you absorbed everything, and that's perfectly okay. It's okay to ask questions, too, because, like I said, we've all been there. All of us. Even your teacher. Probably the president, maybe. Of Gordon, I mean. Or also probably of the United States. Po poetry is kind of difficult to master. Here's some of the works and scholars I referenced. Feel free to check them out. It's a shame I ran out into this much time. I had planned to work on Human Life and Limbo with you, which are two other pieces by Coleridge, as well as part two of Christabel. But if you get a chance to go adventuring through, through more poetry of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, I definitely recommend it. If you're interested, here's a quick blurb about me. At the time of this video, I'm ending my second semester in college. I'm an English major who has a terrible problem with spelling things incorrectly and doesn't type properly on social media. My issue with spelling earned me the nickname Chesley because I literally spelled my own name wrong on a sticker that I printed out. I did that more than twice trying to correct it. I'm working on getting on my bachelor's in English before continuing my education to eventually get my doctorate. And then I'm going to teach English. I'm never leaving school again. I keep a hobby of voice acting and online projects. My most often voice sounds like this. And I realize now that I've been talking for a really long time. So that's the end of my video. Thanks for watching. Hope it helped.